going to have a lot to say about that. But first, I want you to know that if you're not a math and science person, you are safe. Same with me, because I am not. If you're anything like me, as soon as that went up on the screen, your brain would not turn out. <laughs> math and science were so unnatural to me in the school that I was really worried about my teacher. His teachers who I liked and respected were saying, you have got to get this. Math and science are going to be important to you later in life. You're going to need that. And I thought, I hope not. <laughs> because if so, things are going to be grim. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, ooh, there I am. <laughs> I worked really, really hard at math. And occasionally I'd find my way to an answer. But I couldn't tell you how I got there. And I couldn't get there again. And I was having a lot of the same experience with happiness. It fell from the sky or it didn't. And I, there would be these short bursts of joy and I would uh, enjoy them and love them and then they would go missing and I had absolutely no idea how to bring them back. Algebra was it was like hitting a wall. I thought, I do not have the ability to do this. And then I met set theory. And set theory really helped me with math. But it helped me with a lot of other things, too. And so we're going to have a quick refresher, if you don't mind. Set theory, or my level of it anyway, uses Venn diagrams to visually lay out math problems to help solve them. You start with a master set, which is called, wonderfully, the universe. So if the universe is 100 kids in the 10th grade, which is when I met Venn diagrams, and if we know that uh, A equals the 75 kids who play soccer, and B equals the 45 kids who play tennis, and we know that there's an overlap of 35 kids who play both soccer and tennis, it's a very active class, then how many kids play either soccer or tennis, and how many play neither? <laughs> Math person. You're right, you're right. And I, once I could see it on a diagram, I could work it out that 85 kids played either soccer or tennis and 15 played neither. So Venn diagrams were a revelation to me in math. They saved me, I loved them. And I loved them so much that I started using them to think about other things, like how I connect with other people. So for instance, if the universe is Savannah, which Let's just say it is. <laughs> and A are the people who are interested in coming to TEDx, and B are the people who could get today off of work, and C are the people who could swing a ticket, then the intersection is us, the people here today. Or if A are people who like to go see live music, and B are people who can't stay up past 9.30, the intersection's pretty small. And since I'm in it, I'm interested in knowing other people who are in it. So there are sets of ideas and beliefs and uh, activities. There are writers groups and training teams and political parties and cancer survivors and hackers and locavores. We seek out our tribe. And all of these sets layer and intersect. And the friction of that intersection and I use friction as a positive word, as energy, like rubbing a balloon on your head, ah, static electricity. The friction of that intersection powers the community and powers us. And now that we're talking about physics, because we are, starting friction is greater than rolling friction. My scientific source for that is car talk, but <laughs> it makes sense. It's hard to start. It's hard to get up off the couch and put away the laptop and turn off the TV and go out and be with people. But once we get there, it gets easier. And that rolling friction powers the community and powers us and powers hand-cranked happiness. Happiness that we worked at and made 
by showing up and being with other people. So, why don't we just identify that happy center where all the ideas and people and things and activities that we love layer and connect and just hang there all the time? My guess is that it's because we're not static sets. We're fluid beings. The things we care about, the people we relate to, what we like to do, constantly fluctuate and change. Because we're growing and we're human. And because people can be really annoying. <laughs> they won't communicate or they won't stop communicating. They don't show up when they say they will or they show up and they won't leave. Or they're on their phones every 30 seconds, even when they're with us, even in conversation. And it gets to the point where we wish they would take their increasingly complex yoga schedules and just get out of our hair. <laughs> and then they do. They finish their masters and they move away. They fall in love with someone else or just out of love with us. People die. And this is where I get stuck. Because that little voice in my head is saying, wait a minute. I worked hard. I got out in the community. I made a little happiness. And then look what happened. It got taken away. Now I have to move forward with all these holes in me. But that is where the diagramming comes in. Because holes aren't an accurate visual. Every one of those people, even the treacherous ones who left town or left me, are still part of the equation. Because if they were truly gone, if they were completely absent from my universe, it wouldn't hurt so much. So they're in there. They're in some percentage but not in the same way as the people who are still present, who are still here with me. So if I can get up off that couch again and start again and go out and be with the people who I know and care about, the friction of that connection allows me to crank up that mill wheel of happiness. And I can't do that by myself. What I can do is use math and science, just like they said I would, <laughs> to make more happiness. So when you're having that rough day or week or year, think about the people that you know, those inspiring, supportive, occasionally incredibly annoying people, and go be with them. Because happiness doesn't fall from the sky. We have to hand crank it. Thank you. Thank you.